Hello, from LPL Financial, welcome to The Talking Point. I'm your host, Quincy Crosby. Good morning, everyone. It's Quincy Crosby. It is The Talking Point. It's Monday morning, October 31st. Before we launch into everything that is due this week, I wanted to point something out regarding earnings season. So far, we have over a third of the companies reporting. And what we have seen is that the results coming in uh, for the earnings are actually inching a bit higher. This is all despite, you know, the, the, what shall I say, disappointment coming out of big tech. The fact of the matter is that what we're seeing is that with about 52, 53% of the S&P now reporting, 71% of the S&P 500 companies have reported basically year over year earnings growth that is now up about 2.2%. This is the blended results and blended means the actual results and expectations. This by the way may not sound good but it is up from 1.5% a week ago. And so we started the earnings season with expectations that the blended results, again, which include the actual results and also expectations. We started off with the expectation that it would be about 3.8% year over year. And to repeat, a week ago, it was down uh, about 1.5%, and then it inched higher to 2.2%. So as we go through and finish up the earnings season, we'll see if we get back up to about 3.8%. In terms of the um, uh, price to earnings ratio of where we are this morning, the S&P 500 on 12 month looking ahead is at 16.3 times Um, forward earnings. Uh, The five-year average, by the way, is 18.5 times forward earnings, and the 10-year is 17.1 times forward earnings. So again, so, you know, we could all go and say, look at how bad things were because of the big tech numbers, except actually Apple was not, it, it, it disappointed, yes, but not in the way that we heard from the other big mega tech names. Certainly the stronger dollar was a headwind, especially when you take the stronger dollar. And then if you're a multinational company and you have weaker global demand, the two, the combination is, is basically, it hurts the big multinational names. And we saw that with uh, some of the big tech names. But overall, I do want to point out that we had strong earnings in the energy sector. We're going to be getting more information about the um, healthcare names, but the biggest part of the stock market uh, are actually not just uh, the big uh, tech names. We're so used to those large tech names, the mega cap tech names leading the market, you know, five names leading the market. A much healthier market has breadth. We talked about that before, breadth, meaning more and more names, more and more sectors helping to lead the market higher. That's a healthier market. I also want to add that on Thursday and Friday in the rally, we saw the volume come in. I always say a strong volume, I mean heavy, heavy buying, actually offers confirmation uh, in terms of investor enthusiasm. It inched lower. That said, when we look at selling, we also look at volume because if the volume in the selling is just dramatic, it tells you that uh, uh, you know investors and traders alike want out. Uh, we think that most likely uh, institutional money managers now just holding back a little bit uh, and waiting to see what we hear from the Federal Reserve this week and and the uh, you know breadth so to speak of data this week which I will get into. I also want to add another thing 
And this is, I think, important. Last week, I looked at the leadership in the market was energy, but we're seeing industrials, the sector, start to inch higher. Uh, keep your eye on that because, uh, you know, we are always looking for the sectors uh, that, that start showing signs. I, I call them green shoots. You've heard that term with regard to data releases. Oh, we're seeing green shoots, uh, you know, showing us that maybe there's this positive momentum somewhere in, in, a, in, in the backdrop. But in any case, uh, we will keep our eye on, on um, the sectors. I also want to point out too, that we saw consumer staples continuing to do well. When we leave a bear market in general, this is not to say we're leaving a bear market right now, but we like to see consumer discretionary get a move. And, and it, it, you know, it is the underpinning for growth, but we have not seen that. But nonetheless, I did see last week um, the um, semiconductor names. The reason I pay such close attention to the semiconductors, you could see it through the Philadelphia SOX Semiconductor Index, is that the chips are everywhere and they tend to be a barometer of growth, a barometer of a slowdown in growth. Now, granted, there were those who were looking at the semiconductors and saying, you know what, there's, there's too much manufacturing of it, not enough growth, a recession is near, but nonetheless, I take a look and I watch to see which sectors are, are leading. So again, a very strong week. In terms of the metrics, on uh, we look at oversold and overbought. We have inched closer to overbought territory with, um, with the market. That doesn't mean the market can't continue to rise. Obviously, it certainly can. But unless there are catalysts for the market to continue to rise, what we typically see is something comes along and allows the market to sort of di blow off that over overbought uh, conditions. Similarly, when we get to oversold, uh, you know, the market then something comes along and helps the market move. So keep that in mind. Last week, in terms of the data, just to point that out, uh, we saw much of the data, particularly with regard to inflation, come in along the expectations uh, that the uh, estimates were. That said, it still shows that inflation is, while it's coming down, is still high. There's no doubt about it. But the fact is, we saw that with the GDP report for the third quarter coming in at 2.6%, much of it having to do with trade. But we saw another report showing that inflation is climbing lower. And that is good news. Is it good enough news for the Fed? Well, we will find out. But the fact of the matter is that inflation is inching lower, perhaps not at the pace that the Fed needs in order to say, hey, we've reached our, our end rate, that we, no one is expecting that at this point. Also, I do want to point out, there is this tug of war in the market regarding a recession. We saw that the 10-year Treasury yield, right, and the three-month Treasury note has become inverted. In other words, the three-month Treasury note yield is now higher than the 10-year Treasury bond yield. That is perhaps the most favorite um, indication for the Fed of inflation. Now, if it inverts or, you know, uh, inverts this week, It'll just mean that it wasn't as strong a signal as you're looking for, not like the 10-year and the two-year, which has been inverted for some time. But we are keeping our eye on the three-month note and the 10-year. This is important because the tone of the market really is, okay, is the Fed almost finished? That's one thing, right? And are we going into a recession? And if we're going into a recession, what kind of recession? So far, so far, I mentioned this over and over again, according to a number of the reports, Fitch ratings, the credit rating agency, and a number of others that the recession at this stage, given all of the information we have, could be a short one, short duration recession. And if that happens, 
uh, you know, obviously, it is much better, clearly, than, a, you know, a recession that is deep, uh, where you lose so many jobs and, and, and you get rid of inflation. Sure you do, but you also bring the economy to its knees. That is not what is seen at this point with the data that we have. Now, this week, the data are just, uh, you know, one after another. And I want to mention that tomorrow... Uh, today we'll get the Chicago Purchasing Manager Index. The expectations are that it will be a little bit higher than the previous. That'll median, the median forecast right now is for 47, and this is for the period of October. However, tomorrow we will get the Institute for Supply Management Manufacturing Index. The expectations are that it will be just a tad above the contraction and um, growth line, which is 50. And so last one was 50.9. The expectations are that it will be 50.2. Coming down and getting to that line uh, in the sand of expansion and contraction, which is 50. We've also been following the Standard and Poor, the S&P manufacturing reports. This is the, their final purchasing manager index. And they are looking for a number right now of just below 50. The job opening report, why is that important? Because the Fed, in trying to tamp down inflation, wants to see the number of jobs that are open coming down in a meaningful way. We did lose a million jobs. Uh, right now, the, um, the openings are about 10 million jobs, but there are also so many workers uh, that have, how do I say this? You know, they, they can quit and find another job in, in you know, just a, a few weeks and earning more money. That is still an issue for the Fed, that wage growth, while living, leveling off to some degree, particularly in the services area, that wages are climbing higher. The Fed wants to see this coming down in a meaningful way. They would prefer to have job openings ease and come down rather than, you know, seeing the unemployment rate climb higher and higher. But again, what is their goal? Their goal is to have the wages come down and have employees lose their leverage with employers. And the reason for that is they don't want the wages as an input cost to be passed along in higher prices because that is the issue for inflation. It is the higher prices. So that's something that the, um, you know, that the uh, market is going to pay close attention to. So that would be tomorrow, the job opening reports. Uh, we'll see construction spending and motor vehicle sales. Obviously, on Wednesday, we also get the ADP employment report. Uh, this has been reformulated. Keep in mind, it is not a direct uh, positive correlation is does not have a direct positive correlation with Friday's report. Please keep that in mind. Nonetheless, the trend in the private sector, because that's what the ADP employment report does, the trend is important. And the expectations are that it will show a lower amount of new job openings than we had before. The last report was 208,000 new jobs. The expectations are that new job openings will come in below 200,000. And of course, on Wednesday, we will have the uh, Federal Reserve announcement. I can't stress how important this is, and keep this in mind also. We were showing the Fed of Funds futures market. This is the market that collects all of the uh, traders and, and investors what they think is going to happen at that meeting. What is the number going to be for the rate hike? Or if you were looking at rate cuts, you would have the same, same thing. It was about 95% certainty at 75 basis points, right? That has changed and it has come down now to about 89% probability of a 75 basis point. Uh, cut. So it's still strong. There's no doubt about that. It's still strong. And it, by the way, given the amount of data that we'll have before Wednesday afternoon, uh, it may pop up again 
to uh, you know 95 percent, but it also can come down. Why would that be? Why would it pull back? How about the expectations that the Fed, you know, is set to begin a discussion of perhaps keeping the rate cycle, but to start lowering the uh, actual uh, interest rate hikes. In other words, going from 75 basis points and in December going to 50 basis points and then taking us into the next quarter uh, at, a, at a lower pace, uh, a lo not, not pausing, but just lower rates and less, less uh, aggressive rhetoric. This is going to be crucial for the market. And the statement may give us a hint, but I think it's going to be with Powell's comments. He has to be very, very careful here because inflation is still high. He can't come out and then suddenly, you know, be dovish and say, well, you know, we, we can leave, we can pause. That's not going to be positive for the market. However, he did mention at the end of September, I believe it was September 21st, that the Fed at some point is going to slow down a bit, not pause, but the amount of the rate hikes would ease a bit. And certainly we have heard from the number two at the Fed, Lael Brainerd, that she's concerned about financial conditions tightening too much, perhaps causing accidents, you know. Uh, and we've heard from Mary Daly, who's head of the San Francisco Fed, similarly coming out and saying, now's the time to be talking about this and to, to do something that we, we don't continue these very aggressive rate hikes. This, I do not believe they were going rogue. I think that they came out and basically gave examples of what the Fed is talking about. And with Chairman Powell's permission or acknowledgement that that is what we're going to see. And that is why I believe that the Fed Fund's futures market has pulled back its expectation of 75 basis points. I We still think that that's what we're going to have. But keep in mind something. The Bank of Canada, very aggressive, came out with 50 basis points rather than 75 basis points hike. And the European Central Bank that came in with 75 basis point, Christine Lagarde actually said, we are now sensitive to concerns over a slowdown in the economy and the rate hikes will, will reflect that. She's telling you, she's signaling to the market that most likely it will not be 75 basis points again. So this is going to be interesting and the market is going to be judging how Chairman Powell packages this, how he packages it. He doesn't want to come off as caving and, you know, suddenly we're going to pause and suddenly we're worried about, about recession. But how he packages, he has to be hawkish but perhaps less hawkish in his statement. And we'll see if he, how many questions he actually answers. And then uh, on Friday, needless to say, it is the payroll report. Expectations are that the unemployment rate jumps a little bit to 3.6% from 3.5%. Uh, and average hourly earnings, which is crucial, levels and stays at the same level. We don't want to see those average hourly earnings climbing higher. That's extremely important. Also, expectations are that we will go from 263,000 new jobs that we had at the last report and that for October it goes down to about 225,000 new jobs. Remember, Americans are still spending. That's what we saw from the GDP report. Uh, we are still spending. We saw it from the Personal Consumption Expenditures Report, the PCE, which is the Fed's favorite look at um, inflation. Americans are still spending. Has it slowed down a bit? Yes, it has, but we are still spending. It's hard to kill our economy. And obviously, the Fed would prefer to kill inflation without killing the economy. That is the soft landing, right? The soft or softest landing comments that Chairman Powell has mentioned. However, if that doesn't work, he has said we are prepared to allow a recession in order to do it. He said it in so many words. So 
This market is so focused, and I have to point this out, global markets are so focused on the Fed because the U.S. dollar has eased a bit, given the notion that the Fed will now transition to a pace of interest rate hikes that will be lower than 75 basis points. The dollar has eased. That is helpful for not just the global financial conditions, but also for our multinational companies to see a dollar easing. We're going to, we're going to pay very close attention again to everything that the Fed says and also the ramifications in the currency market and also in the Fed funds futures market for December after he uh, has his statement. Uh, in closing now, I do want to mention that we're entering the period in which the seasonality takes hold. So many people talk about it. We've had a lot of questions about it. This is the period, with or without a midterm election, by the way, in which seasonality is most favorable for the market. When you have a midterm election, it ramps up. The midterm election, the presidential cycle, the market has a history of doing better, not just right afterwards, but for the next 12 months. I do want to point out that we, we do think that it will, it will help underpin the market, but you still have a Fed that is raising rates. Whether or not the market sees that the Fed is transitioning, not pivoting, but transitioning to a, you know, less hawkish rhetoric and just moving towards the terminal end rate, which by the way, right now is circled in and penciled in at about 5%. Um, whether the Fed, whether the market sees that easing as significant. So far it has, all based on the Wall Street Journal piece that came out a number of days ago, uh, saying that the Fed is looking to shift, to have a downward shift, not a pause, but a downward shift. So, so much going on, but I did want to point that out, that we are entering that period that is the least difficult for the market, and uh, it allows the market to enjoy an underpinning of, a, um, of, of seasonality, very positive seasonality. So thank you very much. Again, please don't hesitate to call. Uh, we will be happy to get back to you right away. Thanks so much. Have a good week. This material was prepared by LPL Financial. It's for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. There is no assurance that the views or strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal. Any economic forecast set forth in the podcast may not develop as predicted and are subject to change. References to markets, asset classes, and sectors are generally regarding the corresponding market index. All indexes are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. Index performance is not indicative of the performance of any investment and do not reflect fees, expenses, or sales charges. All performance reference is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All information referenced in the podcast is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and broker dealer, member FINRA and SIPC. Insurance products are offered through LPL or its licensed affiliates. To the extent you are receiving investment advice from a separately registered independent investment advisor that is not an LPL affiliate, please note LPL makes no representation with respect to such entity. If your financial professional is located at a bank or credit union, please note that the bank or credit union is not registered as a broker dealer or investment advisor. Registered representatives of LPL may also be employees of the bank or credit union. These products and services are being offered through LPL or its affiliates, which are separate entities from and not affiliates of the bank or credit union. Securities and insurance offered through LPL or its affiliates are not insured by the FDIC or NCUAA or any other government agency, not bank or credit union guarantee guaranteed, not bank or credit union deposits or obligations, and may lose value.